What's up, Prime Fam? We are back with the whiteboard video, although in modern society we have these glass dry erase boards. Now, if you guys have been a long time follower of the channel, you know I used to love doing my whiteboard deep dive videos where we would break down the nuanced, nitty gritty details of various topics concerning strength training, bodybuilding, powerlifting, etc. And we're doing that again. And today we are going to teach you how to choose the best exercises for your powerlifting or strength based program. Now, this video will also cover um, really deep understandings for any of you concerned with bodybuilding or hypertrophy or just general athleticism. Uh, you can extrapolate quite a bit from this video even if you're not necessarily a power lifter because how I'm going to teach you how to choose the best exercises really applies to all those realms. It's just going to be extrapolated slightly differently and we will cover that and I'll probably do more videos specific to bodybuilding and other various adaptations in future uh, installments of the series. But today we're going to teach you how to choose literally the best exercises for your program, basically how to build uh, a day within your training micro cycle, meaning your training week, how, how do you select the best exercises? How do you outline this in a program and put it together so you know day number two in the gym, I have this squat exercise, this deadlift exercise, this accessory exercise, how do you do that? That's what we're gonna explain today. Now full disclosure before we get into this, a couple things. One, if you want some professional help with this and you want to have uh, someone like myself take over your training, your, your just get you to a highest level of your potential uh, with your training, nutrition, etc. We are taking clients right now. You can sign up for a free coaching diagnostic using the link below and you can talk to me one-on-one -on -one for free to talk more about your goals and see if you're a good fit for our coaching services. We offer a really comprehensive online coaching system that really no one else does in the coaching realm that I'm aware of. And then also, if you guys are a little bit tight on money, we do have our group coaching programs, which utilizes everything we're about to talk about today. And it's really, really affordable. It's only $45 a month and you get access to all sorts of private videos on our website and you get a good, awesome, semi-customizable program. You get access to me and email and a few other things. So go check that out. Now, for, for those of you who can't afford any kind of coaching, I want to provide you guys a lot of free information. And that's what we're going to do today. The second thing I really want to disclose though here is I'm not going to put timestamps in this video because truthfully, if you're skipping around, you're not learning anything. You got to watch everything I'm going to say today to fully understand and conceptualize how to best go about choosing exercises for your strength or powerlifting program. So we're going to dive in because there's so much to cover here. We have a ton of different categories. Now, before we even get into the nitty gritty details of how to choose the exercises, we have to understand how to outline your training day. Because if you don't understand how to outline the training day, you're not gonna be selecting the best exercises for your individual needs. So we're gonna to get to that, but we have to talk about the actual training day itself and how the outline of that should go. We're gonna start here with types of exercises. So there's really three main types of exercises when looking at a broader hierarchy of your microcycle setup meaning you're basically your training split when you set it up there's three types of exercises you're going to be concerning yourself with the first one is your main progressions and these go in order so your main progressions are always going to come first and we have kind of an outline example workout here of kind of a lower body uh, training day in a program and what you have to understand is the main progressions will always come first so um, for instance, we have main progression number one, high bar squat, main progression number two, beltless deadlift. What is a main progression? So a main progressor is going to be an exercise that is highly loadable in small incremental adjustments from week to week. So a squat or a deadlift are going to have the ability to be overloaded in small adjustable amounts. For instance, something like a lat pull down or a leg extension, you're not going to be able to load in very small percentages from week to week, which is very important when you're talking about your main progressors because strength adaptations are slow unless you're a complete rank beginner. So you can't just be jumping up in weight by 5%, 10% every time you go into the gym. So you need a main progression that utilizes a lot of joints or muscle bellies in one um, kind of exercise that allows for high loading capability so you can incrementally load it from week to week. So these are always gonna be your main progressions. That's why we call it a main progression because you're able to progress this exercise and focus 
on the number one tenet for strength and hypertrophy adaptation, which is progressive tension overload, aka being able to just make sure your muscles and CNS are always receiving a new style of stress, or in this case, tension. So we always start with main progressions. This always goes in order. Main progressions always come first. There's no time where you're gonna do a leg extension before you do squats. I don't care what someone's told you about pre-exhaustion. I don't care what goofy tactic someone's using. In my opinion, especially if you're concerned with strength, but I would even argue for bodybuilding because it kind of goes the same way, we want our main progressions first. The next type of exercises are gonna be assistance exercises. So these are gonna be the things that in a strength program are usually assisting your main progressors. So in this case, the main assistance exercise here was a tempo plat squat. So a plat squat is kind of a regressed and even progressed uh, variation of the squat. So if you don't know what a plat squat is, it's where you usually elevate your heels and stand very close stance and get into a really quad dominant squatting position. So for someone who has really weak quads, and we're going to talk about weaknesses and needs or what your individual needs are later when selecting exercises, we will get there. Um, what you have to understand is that this plat squat would be assisting someone in their squat, their back squat, who has weak quads. So there's a very specific um, selection process that goes into your assistance exercises. You don't want it to be archaic and random, and we're going to get to how to select that later. But essentially what you have to understand is when we say main assistance, we mean truly assisting these exercises. Another assistance exercise for say something like a beltless deadlift or just your deadlift in general is going to be uh, something like a dumbbell Romanian deadlift, right? So someone who has weak hip extensors and doesn't have a good hip hinge, you know, they might do some RDLs or dumbbell RDLs or something to assist their deadlift and to improve that hip hinging component that plays a large role in your deadlift. So they're assisting this. In a bodybuilding program, your assistance exercises are gonna be more things that are still assisting your main progressions, but a little bit more aimed at muscle bellies and joints and movements, but we'll explain that another time. Um, so we have our main progressions first, and then we get into our assistance exercises. So in this case, we have a tempo plats and a dumbbell RDL. And then after that, we always have our hypertrophy and accessory exercises. So to me, these are different slightly. A hypertrophy exercise is a little different than say an accessory exercise. But what do we mean when we're talking about this category? So these are generally speaking gonna be our single joint more quote unquote isolation exercises, but I really don't like that term because even when you do something like a leg curl, you should be controlling your pelvic positions and things with your abs go into performing that. So it's technically not an isolation exercise, but generally speaking, these are going to be single joint movements where you're target targeting a lot of localized fatigue. So they're going to be more simplistic. They're usually going to be lower loading exercises. So obviously a leg extension, you're not going to be able to load up as much as a squat because you're using only one prime moving joint, which is your knee extensors is where a squat uses your hips, knees, and a few other uh, joints in your body. So single joint movements, but the difference between a hypertrophy exercise and accessory exercise is intent. So the hypertrophy exercise is aimed purely at achieving hypertrophy adaptation in specific muscle bellies. Okay, so in this case, a leg curl and a leg extension, the reason we're doing those is purely for hypertrophy. We're not gonna get a lot of strength carry over to our squat doing leg curls uh, or our deadlifts even. You're just not gonna have that happen, but this is a great way to produce hypertrophy down there, which can then in the long run potentiate more neurological strength adaptations, but that's a whole other video for another time. Now, the accessory exercises, are gonna be kind of the same nature, kind of more single joint or simplistic exercises, lower load, but it's the main goal may not actually be hypertrophy. So in this case, we wrote down hanging leg raise. This is an accessory exercise, but it is not necessarily only done for hypertrophy. So yes, we may get some hypertrophy of the psoas and hip flexors here. We may even get some ab hypertrophy, but your, your goal here, when I'm programming this in this workout, 
What I'm thinking here is this is kind of like a secondary day squatting and deadlifting workout, kind of more variation, higher repetition ranges. And what I'd be doing with a hanging leg raise in this case is really targeting anti-extension through a full body core exercise. So when these are done correctly, and I actually have been showing these in my training vlogs lately, this is gonna really be aimed at achieving strength and movement improvement um, in the context of, of stopping your spine from overextension. So the goal is not necessarily hypertrophy here, as where these two are definitely aimed at achieving hypertrophy. So the intent is different, but they're very similar in the fact that they're, you know, accessory or smaller joint movements. Now this is, um, we, we could even put something in here for like quads. So for instance, we may be doing leg extensions purely for hypertrophy, but maybe in the same day we also have an accessory exercise, like a Bulgarian split squat or something, that is not really actually aimed at just achieving hypertrophy. That may be one benefit that happens, but we're also concerned with, say, doing um, some, some stability and mobility work from our split squats, which is a really great loadable kind of mobility exercise, and we get a lot of stability component to it. So, so these accessory exercises, can be really anything targeting any muscle in the belly and they may not actually even be single joint because technically a split squat uses your ankles, knees, and hips. So it's actually multi-joint, but it's still a smaller exercise that you're not necessarily aimed at overloading. So really, what you'll realize as you go down this hierarchy is each of these drops in probability of overload. So as we get further into the workout, I mean, I can't tell you the last time I've hit a quote unquote PR on leg extensions. To be honest, I don't even know what my PR is on that. I don't give a fuck how much weight I'm lifting on a leg ex ex extension. What I do give a fuck about is how much weight I'm lifting on a high bar squat. Why? It's not that these don't matter for overload, but if I'm overloading this and doing this before I do leg extensions, Guess what? I'm doing leg extensions in a state of higher fatigue. Thus, overload is already incited. I don't need to go heavier on this per se. Of course, over the course of years of training, your leg extension is going to get stronger. And yes, you should use more load, but my intent is never to load these. So main progressions, highest intent of overload. Assistance exercises, moderate intent of overload, but we're really targeting function and not necessarily trying to force or program overload as much. And these, it's really low priority on overload. And so you'll see as the workout goes on, the exercises kind of descend in like loading and, and progression. And it's really aimed at understanding conceptually why we'd want to set up a workout like this. So we have our main progressions, assistance, and then hypertrophy or accessory exercises. Now, before we get into how to choose exercises, there's one more thing I wanna cover, which may seem like I'm jumping ahead. It may seem like I should talk about this stuff first. There's a reason we have to talk about how to progress exercises because it'll teach you how to select them later. So what you have to understand is that as a cycle goes on, you wanna progress specificity. So what I mean by that is this is kind of an off season or like far out from competition slash nowhere near peaking out to hit new one RMs workout. So you're doing high bar squats, beltless deads, tempo plat squats, dumbbell RDLs, pretty non-specific. As I get closer to competition, even if this is like a high hypertrophy day in my strength program, I'm gonna be doing probably competition squats or pause squats at the very most of a variation. I might even be doing comp deads or like a very closer uh, deadlift uh, rather than you know beltless deadlifts, which are for a lot of people really non-specific because some people are really weak without a deadlift or without a belt on their deadlift. I'm probably gonna change these around to be a little different. And so what you have to understand is as the cycle progresses, specificity must increase, which changes what exercises you can select. So the worst thing you could do is, let's say we're in a 12 week training cycle, right? And your first block of four weeks, you're doing comp squats, and then the next block you choose high bar squats, what's gonna happen is your overload's gonna go down. You're gonna use less weight on a high bar squat more than likely if your comp squat's a low bar squat, which for most people in the strength world it is. And you're not gonna have like linear loading of, of or linear progression of loading built into the overall training cycle. So what you have to understand is that before we even talk about selecting the right exercises, as a training cycle goes on, you need to increase specificity. So I wrote examples here. So on your main progressions, this might look like going from high bar squats one block to pause squats the next block, 
and then to comp squats. You could also leave high bar squats for two blocks and then go to comp squat. There is no rule. As long as, generally speaking, a good rule of thumb to follow is it never gets less specific as it goes on. If you want to hold high bar squats in for all three blocks even, that's fine. As long as you're getting kind of heavier on those high bar squats and still have momentum to progress from week to week. Um, now, on the accessory exercises, another example of this would be going from kettlebell goblet squats to a front plat squat to a high bar plat squat. So again, the loading increases. So even on our assistance exercises, maybe we're starting with a kettlebell goblet squat to really just ease someone into a more knee dominant, core dominant uh, squatting assistance exercise after they perform their heavier squats. And then after a block of those, we switch over to a front rack plat squat. So like when you're doing a front squat, but you're doing a, a plats variation. And then maybe we go high bar plats, which is gonna be more loadable than a front rack position is, right? So we're increasing specificity, or really in a way you could look at this as increasing loading potential. Because as we're getting deeper into the cycle, we wanna load more and more. Now there's a couple rules here with the accessory exercises, sometimes get inversely loaded, but we'll get to that in a bit. So now that brings us to the next one. How do you actually choose exercises? Um, this part is kind of in order, but not exactly. It's very difficult to, to put in order to this. But the first thing that comes to mind are goals and needs, aka your weak points, is a good way of viewing this conceptually. That's a really simplistic thing to say, but that's kind of a way that you guys can learn this. What are the lifter's goals and needs? Well, first off, this is where video assessment comes into play. And this is what we do with all of our one-on-one -on -one coaching athletes is we take a look at their squats, right? So let's say they're heavy one RM back squat their hips shoot back a lot in the squat, their knees recede, they collapse over and their core looks weak. There's two things that I notice there, if I'm seeing that. One is gonna be they probably have weak quads. They're shifting everything into their hips. Secondly, they probably have a weak core slash bracing. So when I'm thinking about that, I'm probably gonna go down the rabbit hole of either doing some kind of, um, let's say they're squatting three times a week, to give you an example. Their main primary day, I may want to just keep to competition style squats to reinforce their knees and, and hips staying forward and them staying in their brace. So that way they have a comp specific day to practice. But when we're far out from competition and specificity is low, on their second squat day, I might think doing either an SSB squat or a high bar squat to work more quad, and core and some things like that. So I look, what are their goals and what are their needs? If they want to increase their 1RM on their back squat and their quads and core are holding them back, I'm gonna find close squatting variations that target that. Or if I feel maybe it's not weak points, but their awareness of their body, I might give them tempo squats to fix this. Maybe their quads are plenty strong to be utilized, but they just move like shit because they're uncoordinated in the squat. Well, I'm gonna slow them down and choose a tempo squat. So I'm understanding what their goals and needs are, aka what are their weak points. And I don't just mean muscular weak points. I mean, are they weak? And, and that's kind of a, a trite term, so maybe I shouldn't say weak, but are they incapable at coordinating their body? These are things I'm thinking about when selecting exercises, and that goes for everything. You can see here again in this example day, this workout day, we have high bar squat, followed by tempo plat squat, followed by some leg extensions. Notice this is quad dominant, this is quad dominant, this is quad dominant. This is why I chose this, is because this example workout is more than likely aimed at someone who needs some goddamn more quads in their life. If I'm getting someone who's overly quad dominant, a good example might be Chad Wesley Smith for you guys who remember him uh, back when he used to power lift, if you can remember how he squatted. That guy had too much quads. He had a weak posterior chain in my opinion. So I would have given him much different exercise selection than someone who needs more quads. So this, this workout's great for me. I have weaker quads, weaker core. I'm really posterior dominant. This is kind of what my off season tends to look like quite a bit. So goals and needs come first. Now, how you 
realize someone's needs and how you analyze training footage and also just take a look at their execution and things of that. That's really a video for another time. I wish I could explain that in a timely manner in this video, but unfortunately that would escape like that would take like over an hour for this video, maybe even more. But I don't know, maybe you guys want that. So maybe sometime I'll do that. Number two, second rule, this is probably the second most important is you need to cover more or less all the main functions of whatever you're training for the day. So in this case, we're looking at a full lower body day. So a lot of power lifters will think, hey, don't think about body part splits. Think about uh, movement patterns. I kind of disagree with this. I get what they're saying. I do think when conceptually setting up your exercise selection um, or your workout splits, you do want to think movement pattern over muscle bellies. But generally speaking, I do kind of have a lower body day or a push day, right? Or upper pushing muscles or, you know, whatever. Like sometimes I kind of think about it in that realm because we want to actually cover all the main functions of the human body, at least the ones that are going to, the muscle bellies that are going to be uh, utilized or the joints that are going to be utilized in the big three, which is mostly every joint. So when you squat, bench, and deadlift, you're going to use more than just your quads, pecs, and, and glutes, right? Those might be your prime movers of the big three, but you're gonna have a ton of core um, um, activation going on whenever you squat or deadlift. You're gonna need some low hamstring um, knee flexors to balance out your quads that are gonna get super built up from the squat. That way you don't get knee tendinopathy and other issues. You're gonna need to strengthen your adductors so you're not tearing adductors all the time. You're gonna need to strengthen even your lateral delts and forearms for stability in the bench press. There's a lot of reasons that you wanna train all functions of the human body. And so what I think about if I'm on a lower body day, am I covering all the main functions? Well, we have knee extension, we have hip extension, right? We have variations of those. We have knee flexion, we have isolated knee extension outside of just this. And this is really more terminal knee extension, which is a, a video for another time, but you're really overloading the lockout, the terminal knee extensors, as where this is more tension in the bottom of the squat, near the lockout of the squat doesn't have much tension. So you neglect terminal knee extension, right? So we get terminal knee extension here. We're training hip flexion, which is very underworked in power lifters. We're kind of covering all the main functions. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other small little functions of your human body that aren't necessarily getting addressed in this workout, but generally speaking, all the main ones are getting covered. Knee extension, knee flexion, hip extension, hip flexion, right? And, and just kind of various forms of those. So we want to make sure we're covering all functions. So first comes goals and needs. Then we want to make sure we're doing all functions. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be doing uh, knee flexion based exercises, even if you think it has no carryover to your power lifts at all. Like it's gonna keep your knees healthy and who the fuck doesn't want bigger hamstrings, right? So, so cover all functions. Now the third thing we have to think about is fatigue management though. So we, we can't just slam ourselves with a million exercises and they have to be thought out really well. And this is gonna kind of tie into the next point, so we'll get to that in a second. But generally speaking, if you're doing a squat and then a deadlift and then assistance exercises, which are kind of reductionist versions of the squat and deadlift, dude, good luck doing more squatting and deadlifting down here. Like if, if for this, I was choosing like maybe a, uh, some kind of like Nordic curl and then right here I'm choosing like a, a kettlebell goblet squat and then right here I'm doing really heavy weighted planks with like 445s on my back or something like that. That's a really tough workout. Could I do that? Sure. Am I going to be managing my fatigue optimally? No. Right? And we're going to talk about how to manage fatigue a little bit more here in a second. But what you have to understand is like, okay, we want to choose exercises based on goals and needs. And we want to cover all functions, but you might, if, if you're not careful, you might come to the conclusion that the more squatting variations on this day that target your quads, the better. You're like, oh shit, my knees are receding every time I go to squat. My quads are really weak. Let me do high bar squat, front squat, plat squat, and kettlebell goblet squat. You might think that's an amazing idea. I guarantee you by, you get to, by the time you get to that fourth paradigm of squat variation, you're going to be fucked. You're going to be wrecked. You're going to be overly fatigued and your strength's going to plummet because you can only adapt so far as a human being. So we want to make sure we're managing fatigue. And generally speaking, if you're doing more big exercises up here, these should probably be smaller or a little bit easier, a little bit less uh, globally fatiguing, especially. And that's something worth noting too, that with exercise selection, 
These are globally fatiguing. When you squat, you're going to feel your low back, you're going to feel your hips, you're going to feel your quads, aka your knees. Like You're going to feel all the various joints being worked in there, as where a leg extension is mostly isolated to the knee joint. So for the most part, you're only going to get localized fatigue, which is why it's great for hypertrophy, because you're just annihilating, especially those three quads that cross over at the knee joint, you're really isolating that function and not getting a lot of global fatigue everywhere else. So that way you know your quads are dying out before say something like your hips or low back in a squat. So it's great at producing localized hypertrophy and also localized fatigue so your whole system isn't getting lit up. And so that's really important to understand with fatigue management and exercise selection is that how much global fatigue are you getting versus localized fatigue, right, within that training paradigm. Um, Next, tip number four is going to be closer to competition means more specific. We talked about this up here, but again, I really want to hammer home that how you progress all of these should get more specific, but there's one catch. Inverse accessory exercises close to comp. So actually, sometimes down here, especially if up here is like, say, front squats, which is really light on loading compared to a high bar squat for most people, and then maybe in here you have something else like a, just a hack squat. Maybe you're doing a machine that doesn't cause as much low back fatigue. You might want to put down in one of these hypertrophy exercises something like a kettlebell goblet squat or something that's a little bit harder or higher loading than say a leg extension, right? So the one rule that I kind of follow is as I actually get closer to competition, because these exercises get so much heavier and more specific, I sometimes do the inverse with my accessory exercises. So sometimes the leg extensions, or excuse me, sometimes the hypertrophy exercise in this slot is going to get less specific and lighter as it goes on. Why? Well, because we're going to be under more fatigue. So this is something to understand is that they, they, some of these rules are general and they don't apply all around. So as your main progressors get heavier, right? Remember we go high bar squat, pause squat, comp squat throughout the training blocks of a 12 week training cycle, these might get less specific. You might go something like a big hamstring Nordic curl, which is way more taxing than a leg curl, down to a leg curl, and then maybe towards the end, you're doing like tempo single limb leg curls, really light, really just controlled on form, and not trying to get a lot of overload there. This is a great way to ensure you still keep progressing on these exercises. They get really fucking taxing, but your accessory exercises kind of go on maintenance mode as we're focusing a little bit more on strength and a little less on hypertrophy and some of those smaller movements. So sometimes you want to inverse it. Now, I want to do a follow-up video diving a little deeper on weak points and things of that nature, but generally speaking, there's really no fucking rules here. And I think where people get scared is they want to put together a program that's perfect instead of experimenting. So what I would recommend you do is if you're trying to set up your own training program, main progression, progressions first, assistance exercises second, hypertrophy and accessory exercises towards the end. And then what you want to do is just follow some of these general rules, outline something that makes sense following these rules, and it doesn't actually matter too, too much what you put in here as long as it's following your goals and needs, covering all your functions, managing your fatigue. As you get closer to competition, specificity is going to increase minus maybe on the accessory exercises. There's a reason cookie cutter programs can work because your program really doesn't need to be that individual. When it is very individual to you, it, it is a better program. That's why our one-on-one -on -one athletes get better results than the people doing the group coaching because it is really highly customized to them. In fact, they get a lot better results. But the thing is, that doesn't mean all your results just go out the window. Um, don't be afraid to experiment, guys. This is really how I learned to program. And this is what I wanna cover in today's video. If you guys are interested uh, to see more on this topic, I'd love to hear some thoughts about how I did explaining this stuff. And I want to cover this in more installments in the future. Maybe I'll do this in a podcast too with Dylan. If you guys are interested in our group coaching, go sign up. $45 a month. It's on the website. You get access to private videos kind of like this all the time talking about these topics. You also get access to an awesome kick-ass program. We have the SBD program, which is a powerlifting program. We have the Fusion program, which is a bodybuilding powerlifting hybrid program. And then we also have the Prime program, which is what I run, which is kind of like combining strength training with bodybuilding and functionality work, being really athletic and moving better. Um, so there's a lot of cool programs out there. We also are taking one-on-one -on -one athletes. So if you want to go uh, sign 
sign up for a free coaching diagnostic meeting, sign up using the description box down below. Please comment on the video, guys. Even if like you just love the video but didn't have any questions or anything, comment something down below. Comment, show me your teats. That, that would be a good one to comment. That way the algorithm picks up this video a little bit and some of these longer format videos actually do good on YouTube. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.